Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the Lindsays, one with an A and one with another E, and Dan and Josh for inviting me to this wonderful series. It's a great honor to be with you today and to bring the perspective of perceptual psychology to possibilities for music theory and analysis. Echoing my colleagues David Huron and Justin London, I fervently believe that music theory can benefit ginormously from concepts, theories, and models drawn from experimental psychology. I started out in music theory and composition and early on went over to the dark side of the force to become a scientific psychologist, but always keeping my eye on the light that warms my soul, music. Presuming we actually have souls, but that's a bit dualistic in nature. Whatever, I love music. The work I would like to describe today has served as a seed for a much larger framework considering the analysis, creation, and teaching of orchestration from scientific, humanistic, engineering, and artistic points of view. Our primary aim in the ACTOR project is to understand the conception, practice, realization, and perception of orchestration. This talk will focus on some of the basic categories of auditory grouping that we have developed into a full taxonomy of grouping-related orchestration devices. I will partially focus on how musical timbre depends on and affects different grouping processes, one of the crucial elements in orchestration practice. Although, of course, many other musical parameters and their interactions come into play in what we hear in orchestration, and most of them interact very tightly with timbre. Here are some of the roles of auditory grouping processes in orchestration practice and realization, but certainly not all. One can create new timbral sonorities in music with fused events resulting from the blending of sounds from different sources. One can enhance the differentiation between auditory streams or cause their integration into surface textures by playing with similarities and differences of various musical parameters. It is important to distinguish auditory streams from musical parts or lines, as David Huron has noted. One can create loose groupings of instruments into different orchestral layers or strata on the basis of similarities and differences in various musical parameters, including timbre, and depending on the relative perceptual saliency of these groupings, they may occupy layers of differing prominence with more salient events being brought to the foreground. And finally, one can use varying degrees of continuity and change in musical parameters to create a hierarchy of nested groupings at the levels of motives, phrases, themes, and sections. The degree of change in these cases signals the strength of the boundaries and thus their hierarchical importance. What one perceives depends first of all on the physical properties of the incoming sound, second on the way one's auditory system encodes that information, and third on how the encoded information gets parsed and grouped into coherent percepts. Imagine how much more difficult it would be to make sense of the world if all incoming frequencies, even those emanating from the same sound source, were treated as independent perceptual events. Or conversely, if all sounds got glommed together into one unintelligible sound mass. Generally, the auditory system is trying to understand what the sources of sound vibration are in the world and to track their behavior if they seem important. But this can carry normal everyday hearing baggage with us into the music listening situation and composers can make use of it. This presentation is thus about the importance of auditory grouping and the perception of a particular kind of multi-sourced auditory scene, music, and in particular, how intuitive understanding of these processes plays out in orchestration practice. The domain of auditory scene analysis was founded by Professor Al Bregman at the Psychology Department at McGill University back in the 1970s. His seminal book on the subject was published in 1990, and I have the great honor of being one of the people he taught how to think. Before we go any further, I should probably clarify what I mean by the word orchestration. The official definition we use in the ACTOR project is the selection, combination, and juxtaposition of sounds to achieve a particular sonic goal. This, of course, applies to all kinds of music, not just classical Western orchestral music. Analyses of scores and orchestration treatises reveal that many orchestration aims are implicitly related to auditory grouping principles. In terms of auditory scene analysis, auditory grouping processes organize the acoustic environment and determine what sounds are fused together into musical events in concurrent grouping, whether these events are connected into musical streams, surface textures, or layers in sequential grouping, and how listeners chunk event streams into musical units such as motives, phrases, themes, or sections in segmental grouping. According to Bregman's notion that perceptual qualities are computed on the results of grouping processes, 
what might the perceptual qualities and the corresponding orchestral effects be? Timbre, pitch, and dynamics and spatial position emerge from the perceptual fusion of acoustical components into a single auditory event. Concurrent events in music either blend together or their heterogeneity keeps them separate. Similarly, in these parameters, uh, similarity in these parameters is involved in the integration of events into perceptually connected auditory streams, textures, or orchestral layers. And conversely, differences in them provoke the segregation of events into different streams or orchestral layers. Discontinuities in musical parameters promote segmentation of musical units, whereas a succession of unchanging or gradually changing blended or integrated instrumental sounds creates a sense of continuity, which would be grouped over time as one unit. Here we are dealing with orchestral contrasts of varying strengths. Auditory grouping mechanisms give rise to perceptual properties that then acquire musical functions. And it is these musical functions that we then hope to eventually fashion into a psychological foundation for elements of a theory of orchestration. So this diagram gives an idea of the reason behind initially focusing on auditory grouping mechanisms as the beginning of a chain of perceptual and cognitive processes that result from orchestration and give rise to rich musical experience. I will present a taxonomy of categories we've developed to analyze the perceptual results of orchestration that are linked to auditory grouping principles. The primary aim being to develop systematic tools for human and automated computer music analysis that are grounded in knowledge about perception. I'll start with concurrent grouping, whether things blend together or not. Sequential grouping, where we form streams or surface textures or strata, orchestral strata. And segmental grouping with things such as antiphonal contrast, timbral echoes, timbral shifts, general timbral contrasts and sectional boundaries. Let's start with concurrent grouping. Things that maintain certain structure relations over time get grouped together and separate from things that don't conform to those relations. So if you imagine this array of dots as some kind of orchestral texture, some particularly coherent behavior among some of them makes them emerge from that texture, first because they all maintain certain structural relations and second, because they differ in that way from the background elements. In this way, the spotty singer emerges from the orchestral texture. Perceptual fusion results in the formation of auditory images. So in event formation, we find that it depends on a number of concurrent grouping principles, such as onset and offset synchrony, although onsets are more important, harmonicity among the frequency relations, and parallel changes in amplitude and frequency. Many of these can be gleaned from a score, although they also depend on tuning, timing, and dynamics in performance. But fusion of multiple sound sources also depends on a number of spectral relations, such as the overlap and frequency spectra of constituent events and overall spectral density. These properties can only be got from the signal properties and are dependent on the actual instruments used and how they are played timbrally by the performers. So here the basic idea is that auditory attributes such as pitch, timbre, and so on are computed from event properties and according to Bregman's notion that grouping precedes attribute extraction. So the important point here is that timbre depends on concurrent grouping processes. One can create timbres by creating situations where things get grouped together. Now, musicians use the term blend, which we try to relate in the first instance to the degree of perceptual fusion. But it is actually a bit more complicated than that. For example, my student Pierre Jean Ferrara a few years ago has demonstrated with perceptual experiments on blend that one can experience a sense of multiplicity and blend simultaneously under certain conditions, as we'll see with some musical examples in a moment. However, things that are completely separated perceptually are not blended, and those that are strongly fused are strongly blended. The primary cues for perceptual fusion of sounds from different sources are onset synchrony, harmonicity, and coherence and frequency modulation. How do composers and performers use these cues, either knowingly or intuitively, in the creation and production of music? Let's take the classic example of Bolero by Ravel. These properties can be gleaned from the score and thus from a symbolic representation, although they still depend on timing, tuning, and instrumental balance in performance. 
In the sound example I will play, a harmonic series is formed by the French horn at the fundamental, celeste at the octave, or the second harmonic, piccolo at the octave plus a fifth, or the third harmonic, celeste at the double octave, fourth harmonic, and piccolo at the double octave plus a major third, fifth harmonic. They start and stop together and move in perfectly parallel motion, keeping the one to two to three to four to five ratios intact. Here I'd like to introduce the notion of a virtual source or a virtual voice that is created by the fusion of these multiple physical sources. So here you have a good blend between all five of these instruments, except at moments where the horn's a little bit in advance and plays a little bit louder than the others, and it sort of stands out by itself at that particular moment. So here is the uh, concurrent grouping uh, taxonomy that we've developed. And in this concurrent grouping uh, taxonomy, we distinguish blend from non-blend. In a lot of music, non-blend of instruments playing at the same time is the default result. However, when instruments do blend, we have a couple of possible perceptual results that were proposed originally by Greg Sandel in 1991. Timbral augmentation, where a dominating instrument is augmented by one or more instruments which may not be identifiable, and timbral emergence, where the identities of the constituents are subsumed into the whole. A degenerate case of emergent blend is the unison or octave doubling of the same instrument, such as first and second violin sections, or three unison flutes in Mahler, or four unison bassoons in Berlioz. When non-blend occurs in cases where synchrony, harmonicity, and parallelism exist anyway, but the timbral properties of the constituent instruments impede blend, following Sandel's terminology, we call it timbral heterogeneity. For sustained, these events may either be sustained over time or occur briefly as a punctuation. For sustained events, they may be either stable in terms of instrumentation, or the instrumentation may evolve over time, which we term transforming. Punctuation blends are very short and do not allow time to orally analyze their constituents. This is a punctuated emergent blend, although one might also consider it as an augmented timpani stroke, if one likes. Here's an example of a stable augmented blend, stable in the sense of constant instrumentation. The English horn uh, timbre is enriched by two solo celli in this example from Debussy's La Mer. English horn alone, now augmented with the two solo celli. Listen to how that particular timbre of the fusion of those two is affected by being put back into the full context.
Some of the musical examples I will play are taken from the Orc Play Music Library, realized in Orc Sim by Denis Boulian and Félix Barry. This is a tool that has changed the face of what is possible in perceptual research and orchestration because one has access to the individual tracks in a complex orchestral texture, which can thus be deconstructed perceptually, as I've just done. The properties of onset synchrony, harmonicity, or unison in this case, and parallel change play a role. The fact that these instruments change pitch more frequently and independently of the harmonic background of the other strings also helps segregate them from the background. Here's an example from Vaughan Williams' Eighth Symphony from the first movement, and it's a case of a multi-instrument blend in which harmonicity is not maintained strictly in order to respect tonality, but the contours are, are the same within a semitone, which, coupled with the onset synchrony, tight harmonies, and overlapping spectral relations reinforces blend. One might term this a homophonic blend, but note that the strength of blend is somewhat lessened by the lack of perfect parallelism in pitch. Here's a case where blend exists per se, but multiplicity is still apparent. Okay. Here's another example of a transforming blend in which the participating instruments evolve over time. In this case, from Wagner's Parsifal Overture, uh, the violin timbre dominates. Well, let's listen to that alone first. Then this violin timbre is progressively enriched by unison, uh, being joined in unison by high celli, clarinet, bassoon, then English horn, and then two oboes, which fall out more or less in reverse order, creating a kind of timbral arc that follows the melodic arc. Also, the timbral change with dynamics and with a particular register that's being played here. In this example uh, from Debussy La Mer again, uh, the horn timbre is enriched by English horn with a bit of texture added by the detached repeated notes in the horn. However, the glockenspiel, which sounds two octaves higher than written and thus three octaves above the other instruments, does not blend with them even though synchronous, harmonic, and moving in parallel. So this is an example of timbral heterogeneity. So while it adds some interesting uh, sizzle and brightness to this thing, it does not, it sounds separately and does not completely blend together. This heterogeneity is due in part to spectral non-overlap, as explored by Svenamin Lemke and me back in 2015, because the glockenspiel is so much higher. 
and in part by differences in the amplitude envelope, as noted by Damien Talgeu and me in 2012, because of the much sharper attack of the glockenspiel, but also by the glockenspiel's inherent inharmonicity. Let's move on now to sequential grouping. The auditory streams represent the behavior of sound sources over time. It's a mental representation of this behavior. Basically, successive sounds from the same source tend to be more similar in timbre, pitch, loudness, and position in space. And the sounds that differ in some or all of these parameters tend to come from different sound sources. Paul Iverson and Carolyn Vey and I have shown that timbre-based stream segregation is directly related to timbral dissimilarity. So we can use timbre spaces to predict the probability of timbre-based stream segregation. With Amanda Fisher and colleagues, we've shown that in addition to spectral properties due to timbre and pitch differences, additional factors such as onset asynchrony between parts and the degree of part crossing also affect stream segregation in orchestral excerpts. So the important point here is that a differentiation in musical parameters can contribute to stream segregation, whereas similarity, similarity promotes stream integration. Note that in all of the blend examples I've presented, the sequences form integrated streams because either the instrumentation stays constant or evolves very slowly and smoothly. We distinguish the vertical blending, which does depend on maintenance of relations over time, from the horizontal process of connecting events to one another over time in stream integration. Segregation is mostly the rule in a large majority of pop music, with the possible exception of horn sections and backup vocals in tight harmonies as well as in polyphonic music, where part independence is sought. Here's the taxonomy that we've created for sequential grouping. So we have basically integration of event sequences into a stream or a surface texture, and segregation into two or more streams and or orchestral strata. As before, these can be stable or transforming in terms of temporal evolution of the constituent instruments. One thing of interest in contemporary music since the second Vini school is the integration of successive sounds from different instruments into a stream called Klangfarben Melodie. Here's one of the most beautiful Webernian Klangfarben moments in Roger Reynolds' piece, The Angel of Death. Note that each group is dynamically changing as doubling instruments enter and leave the blended sonority. So for example, here we have the violin joined by the vibraphone or the xylophone joined by the clarinet here. So we get some blending going on there with some notes being held that create a kind of timbral resonance. And this passes to another group, which is evolving. So we have transforming blends that are forming a, uh, basically a Klangfarbe melody over time. To give you a sense of this, let me first play the piano version. the orchestral version. And now an example of a Schoenbergian Klangfarbe melody, which is less melody-like and more like a kind of timbral modulation. Undulating timbral waves alternating between flute, clarinet, bassoon on the one hand and English horn, bassoon, French horn, and trumpet on the other creates a stream of modulated timbre when performed appropriately. There is also an underlying wave modulated at twice the tempo between viola and contrabass, which forms a separate background stream.
let's look at stable stream segregation. So we've looked at some integration cases. Now let's look at segregation. And here's an example from Von Williams Symphony Number 8 again. And returning to this example, uh, we note that the registral and rhythmic differences, particularly the fact that one stream is in 6-8 and the other in 2-4, between the two groups of blended instruments are enhanced by differences in timbre brightness. First, let's listen again to the homophonic blend of clarinets, first bassoon, horns, and trumpets. And then the higher pitch stream of blended flutes, oboes, second bassoon, in unison and octave doublings. And then both together in the full musical context. Note the slightly overlapping pitch registers, but still we have segregation going on. Obviously in this case, because of the differences uh, in things, uh, if you were to play this all on the piano, you might slightly hear different streams as well. Uh, but here, I think the differences are enhanced by the, uh, the orchestration that's going on. Now let's look at two other classes of sequential grouping at a higher level of the grouping hierarchy. The first one is textural integration, okay, which involves two or more instruments with contrasting but often interweaving rhythmic and melodic figures. Okay. And here we're trying to deal with the notion of integration of these things into a single textural layer. Uh, now, texture in this sense is perceived as more than a single instrument, but less than two or more clearly segregated streams. It becomes hard to follow some of the instruments in these cases in their musical context. And here we're talking about uh, an important note about texture in this sense of surface texture here is that it's being used more in its meaning of the consistency of a surface, in this case the auditory surface, if you will, rather than traditional use of this term to denote musical textures such as monophony, homophony homophony, uh, polyphony, and so on. I'll play an example in a moment. Um, but the other type we're interested here is stratification. And this is the creation of orchestral layers. So we have two or more layers of musical material, and they're often separated into more or less prominent strands, and hence the notion of foreground, background, and sometimes middle ground. I'd like to emphasize the graded nature of grouping in general, general at this point, something that's not completely categorical, but which seems to perturb certain music theists. Uh, that is the auditory reality, that things are not always clearly categorizable, and sometimes whether things are stream segregation or a stratification can be a little bit ambiguous and may actually depend on the way it's performed as well and the person listening to it. And our theories need to take these kinds of ambiguities into account. Here's an example from uh, Smetana's Di Moldau that has both of these effects in it. And there are two happening simultaneously, uh, stratification and textual integration. So there's a textual integration in the middle ground with two flutes and two clarinets that are having contrasting material and are integrated into a single layer. And then we have strings alternating with harp in the foreground. That's the first violins. And then the horns and other strings in the background. chord there does sort of emerge quite a bit. Now let's listen to the full context. clearly hear and what's interesting here is that although when you listen to that textural integration all by itself it's easier to hear out the individual flutes and clarinet lines but they then tend to blend, blend together better integrate texturally when they're heard in their full context 
Let's move now on to segmental grouping. Here, basically, the idea is that any kind of acoustic discontinuity can provoke segmentation, including timbral continuity or registral continuity and dynamic continuity and so on. Um, Ren Duliez has shown, following up on the work on the grouping preference rules of Lerdal and Jackendorf, that significant changes in pitch, timbre, dynamics, duration, and articulation can cause segmentation or trunking of sequences at a local level. And then in subsequent work, she showed that large-scale sections of music can be formed on the basis of similarities in register, texture, and instrumentation. Uh, and then when there are changes in all those things, you get segmenting at the sectional level. Okay? I would like to emphasize that uh, acoustic instruments, changes in register and dynamics also create changes in timbre. The important point here is that timbre change can cause boundary creation, and so that would be an orchestrational choice and timbral similarity helps with chunking of events into coherent units. So here's the grouping taxonomy for segmental grouping. Uh, and here there are several subcategories of timbral contrasts, such as antiphonal contrasts alternating between instruments or instrumental choirs, the echoing of a pattern in one instrument by another that simulates distance, the shifting of a musical pattern from instrument to instrument in a chain, general local contrasts that don't conform to these three, and then larger scale sectional contrasts. I want to emphasize the constant play in music between continuity and different degrees of discontinuity, which strongly affects boundary strength and fragmentation, both in composition and performance interpretation. Also, the notion of sectional contrast involves a strong contribution of many different musical factors, such as harmony, phrasing, rubato and phrase final lengthening, in addition to instrumental change, and is very tightly related to formal analysis beyond the local effects of instrumentation. Here we have a, a, a call pattern in the violas and cello, a cello that are joined later by the first basses and then the bassoons, and that is responded to in the violins joined at the end of the call of all the calling instruments. So this is from uh, Schubert's Symphony No. 8 in the first movement. Antiphonal contrasts are often used to emphasize a harmonic pattern such as an alternation between tonic and dominant here when the change is being underscored by instrumental change or instrumentation change in this particular case. Rimsky-Korsakoff writes of the notion of timbral echoes in his orchestration treatise. The basic idea is that the echoing instrument should somehow evoke a greater distance from the listener than the original instrument. Generally, distance is signaled by the ratio of direct reverberant sound, by a filtering of higher frequencies that get absorbed in the air and by obstacles along the way, and by lesser intensity. Uh, the first uh, factor there can be achieved by having offstage instruments, which many composers have used. The other two can be achieved by a change in timbre and dynamics uh, with instruments on stage. One of the pairs that Rimsky-Korsakov indicates to achieve an echo-like effect is flute echoing trumpet, as in this example from Sibelius. So here the change from the brighter trumpet to the mellower flute sound, which also sounds a bit softer, is giving that sense of echo. Here's an example of a timbral shift, which we initially termed the timbral hot potato. And the idea here is you've got some musical pattern that gets passed around from instrument to instrument. And here there are four repeated instruments, uh, instances of this timbral sh uh, shift pattern in this in Be Beethoven's Egmont Overture. 
So we're passing the musical hot potato from clarinet to flute to oboe and back to clarinet, and then that pattern gets repeated as this sort of timbral arc four different times. So that it becomes clear that that is a pattern itself at a larger scale level that is being repeated. Okay. Note that this timbral shift here occupies a foreground position. So let's listen to that one. so on. So basically the idea here is that we've got this kind of pattern that begins repeating and is passing along and here of course as Beethoven often does it involves some kind of fragmentation of the melodic material. General timbral contrast can be used to set off different musical materials with distinct orchestrations in order to highlight the contrast. Local contrasts and instrumental groups are used to set off the alternating musical materials. The first group remains fairly constant with strings and horns, but the second group changes over time from celli to celli plus bassoons plus timpani to cellis plus bass and then to finally to high woodwinds. Modulating concatenated contrasts involves simply detecting changes in instrumentation. However, the Sibelius case is more complex as the groups are increasingly elided with overlapping entries and exits. Larger scale changes can be used to contrast sections, as in this Haydn piece presented in the orchestration graph format developed by Emily Dolan, now at Brown University, in her excellent book, The Orchestral Revolution. In this representation, the presence and relative dynamic of a given instrument are shown in the horizontal lines with different colors for different instrument sections. So you have basically strings on the bottom and greens, and then blues and purples are the uh, winds and then the, the yellows and reds are brass, and then you have percussion up top. Okay. Note the changes in instrumentation between strings plus flute, sometimes reinforced by horn, reed woodwinds, and full orchestral tutti in these cases. So we see some very clear sectional structure that's being uh, set up here by this kind of a uh, visualization. Okay. Note also the intensification of the orchestral texture over the course of the movement. I'll just play parts shown by the black bracket here uh, just to give you a sense of a, a change with this 2D and then back to this part here. modeling issue that arises here is that the fine-grained instrumentation varies somewhat from measure to measure and needs to be contextualized by the longer stretches, which suggests that the time window of analysis is crucial in appropriately segmenting such structures. So we've seen that the role of grouping processes in orchestration uh, includes a number of different things. We can create new timbral percepts in fused events, sometimes by creating uh, virtual sources by combining uh, different physical sources. We can enhance differentiation in auditory streams and uh, we can form different orchestral strata based on the timbral things. And we can use continuity and change in musical parameters to create a hierarchical nesting of motives, themes, phrases, and sections in music. So here's the full analysis taxonomy. Uh, so we have a kind of hierarchical structure in which events are formed that then get connected into sequences of streams, textures, and strata, which in turn get segmented at various hierarchical levels into musical units. However, my hunch is that these levels of grouping feed back on each other in complex ways. And some of the computational modeling work we are doing now with Aurélien Antoine and Philippe Topal is raising this issue. 
So how do we go about analyzing scores using this taxonomy? I'll briefly mention a new computer-based tool for combined score and recording analysis of these grouping effects called OrcView, and a database for the analyses, the Orchestration Analysis and Research Database. We've been developing a computer-based score annotation platform with Félix Barry and Baptiste Volley called OrcView, in which different annotation tools correspond to the various grouping effects in the taxonomy. So shown here, we have basically a segregation effect that's being done, but you can choose between concurrent grouping categories, sequential grouping categories, and segmental grouping categories. In OrcView, scores in either PDF or Music XML format can be annotated. One can select different types of grouping effects, which each having their own color. Each annotation is labeled for future reference in refining or sharing analyses. Bars and staves are already specified in Music XML files. For PDF files, the program attempts to recognize bar lines and staves, and these can be corrected by hand. Time tags can be entered for each bar so that the corresponding recording can be played at the appropriate moment when a given annotation is selected, and the program automatically turns the pages as one listens to a target recording. Most importantly, the results will be exportable directly to the Orchestration Analysis and Research Database, or ORCHARD, where a script will translate the XML code into the necessary structure for the data model. Future taxonomies that are under development or slated for future development include orchestration techniques and Lasse Torsen's oral synology. In this example from the Quatre Etudes, uh, the Fourth Movement in Madrid by Stravinsky, we see some stable, sustained, augmented timbral blends with darker brown indicating the dominant instrument and lighter brown indicating the uh, embellishing instruments. Uh, we also see uh, there's three punctuated emergent blends here in red in this particular case. And there's a segregation between uh, two different clarinets playing different patterns here uh, in, in green in this particular case. One of the advantages of OrcView as a visual interface is that one can selectively display effects by turning them on and off in an annotation list. Because in some scores, I'm thinking notably of Vaughn Williams and Wagner, you can have so many things piled up that it becomes difficult to read everything all at the same time. Orchard uh, currently has about 4,300 annotations from 67 movements of music, mostly from the classical and romantic periods, with some excursions into early 20th century tonal music and one wind band piece from the, the late the 1990s. PostgreSQL is an object relational database system that extends the SQL language by adding many features, and it has a strong reputation for its reliability and data integrity. Solar is an indexing and search engine that provides search capabilities through HTTP requests. Although it provides powerful features such as full text search and faceting, we are probably going to switch to elastic search due to its scalability. As this project grows, more and more data will be available to query, and elastic search will automatically reorganize these clusters of data, thereby improving the search speed of the engine. This change will also allow us to accommodate data mining and machine learning in the future. We developed the Orchard web-based interface using Django, a high-level web framework in Python. Its architecture allows us to easily set up websites by automati automating many tedious processes, such as writing the boilerplate code, linking API endpoints with our model, and so on. Furthermore, Docker lets us separate different aspects of our application into several containers, which are many virtual machines. These containers will each run on their individual isolated virtual environments so that they will not interfere with one another. The functionalities uh, that are designed here include simple and complex queries, the possibility to view annotated scores and to also stream musical clips, to upload future analyses and integrate them into the collection, and then to be able to sort and filter the results when one does queries to try to see what's going on. And uh, most recently, we've been able to save queries to a particular user profile so that as you're doing a research project, you can save up all the things you're trying to get. The whole system runs on Compute Canada's supercomputer network. So here's an example of the, uh, the query builder and its current instantiation, which is being uh, updated and expanded right now. A user can browse the analyses and conduct a simple search with keywords or create complex queries, as is the case here. The query builder lets you specify the parameters in a hierarchical format. It looks complex, but if you understand Boolean operators, it's actually very powerful. Here we're looking for a stratification, as you can see here, uh, that has progressive changes in instrumentation. Okay, 
and it has a violin in the foreground. So anything that has these properties will be searched for, and it has to be by composers whose names either start with ma or muz, uh, in this particular case, and the effect has to have a strength rating of three or greater on a scale of one to five. When the query is submitted, a list of annotations appears, and they can be sorted hierarchically by various criteria, which one can set up over here. Okay, And when the user clicks on it, this result, they get, for example, this page that shows up, where the page of the score that has the thing in it shows up, various details about the, what the actual thing was involved in. So here we have a stratification, a progressive stratification that has three different layers in it, a few notes by the person, and then also you get a recording, a clip from the recording that corresponds to the part being dealt with here. So this has become a very interesting tool to actually uh, sort of store the results of all our analyses and then provide a sort of a, a framework within which other kinds of analyses can take place after the fact. Okay, I'm fully aware that I haven't even touched on many important aspects of orchestration, such as why particular instruments are chosen for the character of a given passage, or how they underlie informal processes in the music, or even why certain timbral combinations are used to evoke a particular emotional tone, such as melancholy, one thinks of the English horn solo in the third act of Wagner's opera Tristan and Isolde, or nationalistic majest majesty as portrayed by Sibelius with brass instruments in the Open of Finlandia. But one thing I hope to have conveyed is that the discussions of music can't be confined merely to melody and rhythm, as discussions of painting can't be confined to uh, shapes and brightness. The wonder of much music comes with the way sound is colored with different musical instruments and their combinations, enhancing form, providing depth, and evoking feeling. Timbre is not merely cosmetic, musical lip gloss and eyeshadow, or as the otherwise brilliant American theorist Leonard Meyer says, a secondary musical parameter. Timbre is a powerful structuring force and vehicle for musical expression and emotion that is achieved through orchestration and depends on many different perceptual processes that give rise to sonic richness. We've explored how auditory grouping mechanisms provide perceptual structuring of musical sound at various levels. And while there is more empirical research to be done on the finer points of how textual integration and stratification and timbral contrast work, there are a number of future directions to explore that arise from these processes aside from getting music theorists to allow us to publish this stuff in their journals. Many event, stream, textural, and layer properties emerge from what gets grouped together concurrently, sequentially, and segmentally. How can we characterize these various properties in perceptual, aesthetic, semantic, and affective terms? How do we characterize the musical functions that these properties assume and integrate these with the many musical functions that have been so deeply and broadly theorized in terms of pitch, duration, and form? And once first steps have been made on these fronts, we can then perhaps start to build a theoretical framework grounded in perception and cognition that addresses what orchestration actually accomplishes at many levels of musical experience. I would like to thank my two main collaborators on this project, Megan Goodchild at, now at Queen's University and Kit Soden at the Schulich School of Music. Uh, the Orchard team, uh, which has been very helpful in uh, getting Orchard going and uh, in a new implementa implementation which should be uh, ramping up hopefully for the fall. Uh, the Orcview team for both developing it and also beta testing it uh, on many different scores so that we now have a little a library that's starting to build up of these things in the Orcview framework. And then of course all of the very fine ears of music perception and cognition lab members. Of course, the Actor Project, Orc Play Music Library, and our funding sources were of great use to us. Many thanks.